so honored to have the chance to be here. I thank God for Brother David Carr so much and the friendship that he has uh, given to me and seeing what God's doing in his life and in his ministry. I thank God so much for the Dean Bergon Society and for the folks that have made this trip. I'm working on an article. I'm not predicting when it will be done. Sometimes things sit in my mind for a while, and sometimes they sit on my desk for a while. But I'm working on an article entitled, The Revival of the Received Text. Many of us believe that it's crystal clear there are two different families of ancient Bible manuscripts, one corrupt and one preserved. And if you would look at the 1800s, as the mission movement that began in the 1700s flourished and reached its pinnacle, there were received text Bibles all around the world in language after language after language. Tragically, towards the late 1800s and very thoroughly towards the 1900s, and it's still happening some places where there's been a received text Bible for a long time, a Bible society would come along, remove that from circulation, and put a critical text Bible in its place. And if you want to go back to the 1950s on, it was almost impossible to, to find a received text Bible in a language outside of English. And it's frightening. Well, by the grace of God, we, we started out doing this eight months ago, trying to put together a list where we'd trace this language by language and what the status of received text Bibles were. And, and I've discovered all over the world there are groups of people that understand this issue that have raised up to address it. Communicated with people in Sweden and Mongolia, Slovenia and the Ukraine. All over the world, in country after country, places you wouldn't, might not expect, the Faroe Islands and the Gilbert Islands, and Finland, and Denmark, and on and on and on, there has been a revival of understanding the importance of this issue and doing something about it. So one of the questions I've been asking myself over the last eight months is where did the revival of this issue come from? Why? And, and, and there's more than one reason, but I want to tell you what I believe has been as significant as anything else. I heard somebody say one day, the Internet has made us all famous. The Dean Bergon Society several years ago began the practice of taking its conferences and making them available, putting them on the Internet, uh, putting them on a website where they could be downloaded like a video library. And I will tell you one of the things I'm conscious of, group after group around the world that today is working on the concept of received text Bible has drawn a great deal of information, inspiration, and challenge from watching sessions that were preached or taught at a Dean Bergon Society meeting. And I absolutely thank God for that. It multiplies the influence and the importance of these meetings. I understand what it's like not to have any information on this issue. This may sound strange in light of all that's going on in our day, but when I went to Bible college sometime a few years ago, actually I went to Bible college from 1971 to 1975, but you understand that was from the age of four to eight. I was a prodigy. I went early. But anyway, I went to Bible college from 1971 to 1975, graduated magna cum laude, and didn't know there were two different textual families of Scripture. It was never mentioned. It was never discussed. Today, as I look back, I assume that must have been a conscious policy to see to it that no teacher ever approached any side of this. And I graduated from Bible college completely and totally disarmed uh, on this subject, not able to grasp what the issues were or what the debate was. I had a complete lack of information. But I was a pretty serious reader, and I would come across statements repeated often. And I guess in my youth I thought if a statement was repeated often enough, there must be some validity to it. And so I would say things about the Bible that were, were uh, today I would see as completely off the wall, but in those days I thought they were scholarly. I would talk about older and better manuscripts. I did that clear up until one preacher asked me, said, Phil, how do you know an older manuscript is better? said, if someone took the book of Mark the day that God used Mark to write it, and someone made a corrupt copy of it that day, and we found it today, it would be the oldest manuscript of the New Testament ever found, and it would be corrupt. That got me to thinking. 
And that got me to studying. Along the way, I've become convinced there's a host of things that are said that the only evidence for them is that they have been repeated a lot by a lot of different people. And if you begin to address those and if you begin to ask questions, uh, by the way, I've discovered that if you begin to ask questions, you'll drive some people crazy. Folks will say, you know, Christ used the Septuagint. How do you know? Did he ever say that? Does he ever mention that in the Bible? How do you know he used it? Everybody knows. And I've discovered that everybody knows is the explanation for a lot of things. Outside the Bible issue, global warming. The evidence for that is that everybody knows. I often remind myself of that as I'm shivering in the windy city of Chicago. I was preaching in the northern tip of the Philippines a few weeks ago. And the mayor of the town we were in uh, took us out to lunch, and she said, uh, Dr. Stringer, could I ask you a question? She said, if global warming is such a problem, why is this the coldest year in record in the Philippines? I thought that was a very reasonably, reasonably good question. But I already know what the answer to that is. Everybody knows there's global warming. The evidence for evolution, too, of course, you know. Everybody knows. And in early years in the ministry... I would sometimes repeat what I now know to be a foolish statement that King James was a homosexual. I repeated that because I'd heard it so many times. When I began to study this issue and begin to question the things I'd heard and, and begin to get a much better grasp of this uh, from the Scriptures and what the Scripture had to say about inspiration, preservation, and so forth, uh, it, it was still a while before I thought about this issue, and on occasion I would keep repeating that statement. Till one day, again, somebody challenged me. I said, Phil, you, you spent a lot of time studying history. Why don't you study this and try and see what the proof for this is? That, that seemed like a reasonable challenge, especially since everybody knows. He was a homosexual. The information must be just right out there for you to get. So begin to study it. I looked, read book after book on King James and article after article about King James, and it was true. I saw it said dozens of times that he was a homosexual, but I kept asking, where's the evidence for that? Anybody can say anything about anybody. The issue is not that someone has said it. The issue is the evidence. And I, I had been told he admitted it. You did a little bit of study. That turns out that wasn't true at all. I'd been told he flaunted his homosexual affairs. Turned out as you begin to study it, there's not one record of anybody ever having seen him in a situation like that. It turned out everybody knows is not such a good answer. I'd like to talk a little bit about what I call the real story of King James. Along the way in my study, I met a gentleman named Steve Coston who, who wrote a tremendous book on this subject, and he and I spent a great deal of time talking to one another, and I'm indebted to him for a great deal of information, but I also picked up a lot on my own by reading literally dozens of books about King James. This is a quote from an independent Baptist evangelist. King James was a homosexual, was a bitter persecutor of our forefathers. King James chose the King James translators, instructed the King James translators, approved and disapproved portions of the King James or of the translators. How can Baptist preachers believe the King James Version to be without error? King James was homosexual. That sounds pretty impressive. It just isn't a bit of it true. Here's another one I apologize. It's presented a little cruder fashion. King James was a fag. How can you advocate a Bible that was translated by a faggot from another independent Baptist? But is that what the evidence suggests? You can all imagine how you would feel if such allegations were made about you. You would want folks to ask the question, what's the evidence for such an accusation? Well, King James was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, June 19, 1566. He was the only son of Mary, Queen of Scots, the very famous Mary, Queen of Scots, who moved from one scandal to another during her entire adult life. His father, Lord Darnley, was assassinated in an explosion when he was only eight months old. When, his, when he was one year old, his mother abdicated the throne of Scotland, and James officially became king, and she never saw her son again. 
During his childhood, he was supervised by several Scottish lords. He had several tutors, all of them evangelical Protestant preachers. He became fluent in Greek, French, and Latin, received classical instruction in all these languages as well as English. He was kept isolated until age 14, and some people felt he was socially awkward because of that. But he developed a great fondness for books, and even as a teenager, he was thought of as a serious scholar. He was slender, average height, enjoyed horseback riding and hunting, he had thin legs, and folks commented on how narrow his jaw was, and that caused some folks to mock his appearance. He opposed the attempts of the Presbyterian preachers to exercise control over the government. However, he constantly supported their doctrine and their preaching. In 1589, he was married to Anne, the daughter of Frederick II, King of Denmark. You might find this next uh, fact a little bit interesting. They had eight children together. In, in some of the history books, it's just, just, it's just common for kings to have wives, royal marriages that meant nothing, and often their wife, wife would live hundreds of miles away from them, and they would go years without seeing one another. And that did happen in European royalty all the time, but it didn't happen with James and Anne. She lived in the palace with James, and they had eight children together. 1603, he was crowned King of England, which made him King James VI of Scotland, King James I of England. He ended the English war with Spain, and England was to have peace and financial prosperity during his reign, uh, which is a great way for a political leader to become real popular. He survived four assassination attempts, including the famous gunpowder plot, which led to the English holiday Guy Fawkes Day. Guy Fawkes was the person who attempted to kill him in the parliament and who failed. Even though he had, as any political leader does, many opponents among the nobility and even among the clergy, he was enormously popular with English people during the time that he was the king. He greatly strengthened the program to colonize the Atlantic seaboard begun under Queen Elizabeth. As a result, the first enduring English settlement in the New World was named after him, Jamestown. His most conspicuous claims to fame are three things. He was responsible for the formation of Great Britain. He brought England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland under one government. He was influential in the colonization of the English seaboard that led to the United States and the King James Bible. By the way, not a bad life's work for one man. Project yourself forward in history a couple of years. What would have happened during the Nazi era if it had not been for the existence of Great Britain in the United States? Ask yourself what would have happened during the communist era if it had not been for the existence of Great Britain and the United States? Even his most loyal supporters say he was sometimes unwise in the people he kept around him. One, one historian genuinely sympathetic to him said he could never tell a good man from a rogue or a wise man from a fool. 1625, he passed away peacefully, his estate. Now, this may come as a shock to folks, but I defy anybody to challenge this. There is no record of anyone ever accusing King James of homosexual behavior during his lifetime. I defy you to find anyone who said that while he was alive. And by the way, when you start attacking a person 25 years after their death, it's a little hard for them to defend themselves. There was a man named Anthony Weldon who was an officer in the royal household of King James. King James knighted him, but he was eventually publicly dismissed from the royal court by King James, and he vowed to get his revenge. 25 years after the death of King James... A year after the execution of King James' son, Charles I, Weldon made public accusations of homosexuality against King James. They were completely dismissed by the people of that day who had enough memory of King James, and we'll get to some things they remembered in a moment. They just completely dismissed it. They paid no attention to it. By the way, I hope you're not shocked. We just came through President's Day. And guess what? All over the television, there was discussion about homosexual activists, about how they know Abraham Lincoln was homosexual. They just know that. They don't have an ounce of proof, but they just know that. It's not unusual for prominent people to be attacked, libeled, and slandered after they're dead. 
And not unusual for it to happen while they're alive either. But it's especially common after they're dead when they can't defend themselves anymore. Well, various people over the years, particularly in the 17th century and the 18th century, begin to pick this up and begin to repeat it about King James. Right? Now, there, there are two primary groups. The Roman Catholics had no sympathy for him whatsoever because he broke their power. And then there were a lot of folks in Scotland who felt like Scotland should never have been brought under the leadership and dominance of England, and they resented him doing that. And those were the two primary sources of critics who spread this story. That is at least into our own day. Been two primary sets of people who've spread the allegation that King James was homosexual in our day. One is the homosexual activist. I have at home a book produced by homosexual activists. There's a chapter in the book about why King James was a homosexual. But by the way, and, and I have, I'm aware of fundamentalists and evangelicals quoting that book as an authoritative source, but there are other chapters in that book that claim that Abraham Lincoln was homosexual, another one that claims that William Shakespeare was homosexual, another one that claims King David and Jonathan were homosexuals, and there's a chapter in that book that claims that Jesus Christ was a homosexual. I'll let you guess how much credibility I think that book has. <laughs> the second group that has spread this have been folks desperately determined to find a way to discredit the King James Bible. Now, I have seen this over and over again. You'll be talking to somebody and say, well, older and better manuscripts discredit the King James Bible. And repeating what I learned, how do you know they're better? Can't answer that. Well, Christ used the Septuagint. That proves you can use any translation. How do you know Christ used the Septuagint? Can't answer that. And, and folks will come up with assertion after assertion that if you just ask them for a little bit of truth or a little bit of proof, they're in trouble quickly. This is usually the last court of retreat. When you've knocked all the other props out of them, how can you endorse a Bible from a homosexual? And tragically, saved folks are really responsible for spreading this rumor in our own day. Folks who claim to know Christ as their Savior, but they can't offer any evidence. In his lifetime, there were many references to his moral character. 1602, Sir Henry Wooten wrote of King James, Among his good qualities, none shines more brightly than the chasteness of his life, which he has preserved without stain down to the present time, contrary to the example of almost all of his ancestors. So, well, this is just people uh, getting along with the politicians of the day. But would you think about that for a little bit? The preachers preached Mary, Queen of Scots, out of Scotland, for her adulteries. They risked their lives. They organized a rebellion. They publicly denounced her Sunday after Sunday after Sunday because she committed adultery. Do you think those same preachers would have covered up homosexuality? Sir Edward Coke, famous English jurist, his books are still in print. He was a political opponent and critic of King James. Jasper Ridley wrote a prominent history of England called Edward Coke the leader of the opposition to the king. He'd been appointed by the king as, as the chief justice of their equivalent of the Supreme Court. And he made a number of rulings against the king, and, and the king was, was strongly critical of him. He considered himself the defender of English common law against the doctrine of the divine right of kings, and James eventually fired him from their version of the Supreme Court. Coke said a number of unkind things about King James on certain subjects. Coke wrote a legal commentary still in use, and he wrote about homosexuality. He said, Buggery is a detestable and abominable sin. It's against the ordinances of the Creator and the order of nature. He was no friend of homosexuality, and he was no friend of the king. And yet, in his criticism of King James, he never makes reference to that, even saying that even though he opposed King James on so many people, he was impressed with his sterling moral example. Arthur Wilson was a historian who wrote during the time of King James. He opposed King James and even opposed the idea of the monarchy. 
he wrote some very harsh sentences about King James on some subjects. However, he also said this about James, his, that his moral life was, quote, decidedly pure, and his own life was pure. And he also said that James never came into conflict with the Presbyterian preachers in the area of morality as his mother had. Bishop Godfrey Goodman lived during the time of King James. He publicly preached against homosexuality, and he publicly preached against King James, and yet he would say about King James, the king himself was a very chaste man. Some folks have read Miles Smith complimentary statements about King James in the preface to the King James Bible, and they say, that's just what you had to do in that day and age to, to get along with the king. That doesn't mean you meant it. But Miles Smith had preached openly and critically of other members of the royal family for moral transgressions. The Puritans he was associated with <laughs> preached against King James routinely, but never questioning his moral character. They were not frightened, helpless preachers. Frankly, you'll find more frightened, helpless preachers in all pulpits today than you did among the Puritans. When James' son, Charles I, became king, the Puritans thundered week after week against his immoralities. They constantly compared him to Herod and considered themselves John the Baptist, yet the same preachers had nothing but praise for King James' moral and spiritual character. Not all the historians have repeated all this slander. Isaac Disraeli, 1863, wrote, Perhaps no sovereign has suffered more by that art which is described by an old Irish proverb of killing a man by lies. The surmises and the insinuations of one party dissatisfied with the established government, the misconceptions of more modern writers, and the anonymous libels vilify the Stuart family, these cannot be treasured as authorities of history. 1891, F.A. Inderwork wrote about King James, said, I think it only justice to say that much of the scurrilous abuse to which he's been subjected appears to be without warrant, and that he was personally a man of good moral character, a quality which, for which he was probably much indebted to the strict and careful training he received from his Puritan teachers. He also said his conduct was everything that could be expected of a good Christian. Historian Samuel Rodson Gardner wrote to King James, his own life was virtuous and upright. These, many of these were people who observed him. Interestingly enough, King James wrote a number of books, which, by the way, are just coming back into publication. Many of them have never been available in my lifetime. I just ordered a set. has not arrived yet. But he wrote, more, published more books than any recorded monarch in any country anywhere at any time. He wrote a book called The Basilicon Doron, which translates the kingly gift. It was written to his son, and it was instructing his son about how he should conduct himself when he became king. Included in the instructions, <clears throat> he said, you'll be asked often to issue pardons as a king. He said, there's four things you should never, ever pardon. He said, don't pardon witchcraft. Don't pardon murder. Never pardon someone who committed incest, and never pardon a homosexual. That's an interesting instruction. And, so, in, in, and he practiced. 1610, he, he was sent by Parliament a list of a number of criminals. They asked him to pardon. There were a number of crimes there. Some of the people that he was asked to pardon were convicted of homosexuality, which was convictable as a crime against nature in English law. He refused to pardon those and pardoned everybody else on the list. Strange activities for someone who was supposedly pro-homosexual. By the way, he routinely listed homosexuality with witchcraft and murder as the three worst sins. And it's interesting. These folks who say, oh, I'm, not, I'm not accepting a Bible that came from a homosexual. No, no, not at all. If this came from a homosexual, why is it so clear on the subject of homosexuality? The denunciation of homosexuality is crystal clear in the King James Bible. And yet, the Bibles those men carry. You would have a hard time disproving homosexuality from. Me, methinks they're looking for an excuse. 
Now, I was fascinated by the fact that King James wrote so much about marriage and morality. Okay. Again, I say, he, his wife lived in the palace with him, which was virtually unheard of. One of the most common evidences given for his homosexuality, it was normal for European kings to have mistresses living in a palace with them, sometimes several. It was actually in the budget of the English government and in the budget of the French government, so much money was allocated for mistresses. And one of the chief evidences people try to claim for his homosexuality is there's no record of his ever having had a mistress or spent any of the money in the budget for mistresses. They said a king without mistresses must have been homosexual. But there is another possible explanation for that <laughs> that hasn't dawned upon some people. He spent much time with his wife. He was openly affectionate to her in public, and he wrote her many love poems and sonnets. He mourned her passing. One day, the unmarried Puritan preacher, John Reynolds, who did so much to spark the translation of the King James Bible, went to the king, and he wanted to protest the official wedding ceremony of the Church of England. During the official wedding ceremony, the groom would turn to the bride and say, With my body, I be worshipped. And Reynolds protested that, since he shouldn't use the word worship. King James responded by saying, pointing out that he was not married, that Reynolds was not married. He said, many a man speaks of Robin Hood who never shot his bow. If you had a good wife yourself, you would think that all the honor and worship you could do her would be well bestowed. 1603, he wrote the following to his wife, Anne. I thank God I carry that love and respect unto you, which by the law of God and nature I ought to do to my wife and mother of my children. For the respect of your honorable earth and descent, I married you. In other words, he married her because she was a king's daughter. That's what royalty did. But the love and respect I now bear you, for that ye are my married wife, and so partaker of my honor as of all my other fortunes, were ye were a king or cook's daughter, it would all be alike to me, you being my wife. D.H. Wilson, who simply was writing about love sonnets, has a chapter about King James' love poems to his wife, and he says, He remained infatuated with his bride, whose praises he sang in sonnets and in other verse. Her beauty, he wrote, has caused his love. He's talked about King James' sonnets to his wife and says, Long smoldering as fire hidden among coals to burst into sudden blaze. She inspired his verse, and her approbation spurs him to persevere through government, though government brings stormy cares. But she is a sweet physician who can soothe and cure his ills. In fact, King James did something unusual for a royal monarch. He wrote and taught that you must be moral, and he wrote his son and told his son about the importance of a king being moral. He pointed out how many civil wars had been started in Europe by the illegitimate sons of kings, and talked about how if kings had just been moral, they could have saved the lives of many of their people. He even suggested that a king must be a virgin when he married because you owed your body to your future wife. And among the many things he wrote on this subject, he said, I trust I need not to insist there to dissuade you from the filthy vice of adultery. Remember only what solemn promise you made to God at your marriage. I don't know about you, but I think we could use some more of that today. He also wrote to his son, Keep your body clean and unpolluted while you give it to your wife, whom to only it belongs. For how can you justly crave to be joined with a virgin if your own body be polluted? Why should the one half be clean and the other defiled? In fact, he constantly spoke of the responsibility of the king to be a moral example to the people. Queen Victoria would later do the same thing, by the way, and modern historians lie about her too. I just got intrigued by that. Uh, at the, the allegations, there was even a movie put out about her having an affair with her carriage driver. So I began to look at that and ask, what's the evidence that Queen Victoria did this terrible thing? And you, you want to know what the evidence is? She made a statement once that the carriage driver made her laugh. That's absolutely proof, isn't it? 
it makes you wonder more about the people making the accusations than it does the people they are accusing. Yeah. People say, ah, but, but, but we got proof he did some strange things, and they like to talk about some things that it turns out were customs of the time. They say, didn't King James publicly kiss men on the cheek? He did. Didn't he call men affectionate names like darling and sweetheart? He did. And they say, ah, this is proof. Didn't men sleep in his bed at night? Those things are true. However, none of them are indications of homosexuality. Assassination of royalty was such a common event, it was customary for kings to have giant beds made and have bodyguards sleeping on either side of them in their bed. Henry VIII, the promiscuous womanizer, no one accuses Henry VIII of being homosexual. But he slept with four bodyguards in his bed every night. King James survived two cat kidnappings and four attempts to kill him. I read several writers said he was paranoid. He kept his bodyguards with him all the time. But it's not paranoia when they're really trying to kill you. <laughs> terms of sweetheart and darling were normal you terms used between men in the 17th century. More recently, I refer you to the movie Gettysburg, where the tough as nails Irish sergeant routinely calls the, his colonel darling. Yeah, but, but didn't he kiss men on the cheek? He did indeed. That was a normal form of greeting in England. It still is in France and in Syria. I have preached in Syria. Bless their dear hearts. When the service is over, you stand there, and the men all come around, and they do not shake your hands. All these rough-bearded men kiss you on the cheek. I would go home back to the hotel looking for some kind of lotion. <laughs> Erasmus wrote of the English, Whenever you come, you are received with a kiss by all. When you take your leave, you are dismissed with kisses. You return, kisses are repeated. They come to visit you, kisses again. They leave you, you kiss them all around. Should they meet you anywhere, kisses in abundance. In fine, wherever you move, there is nothing but kisses. Before you let your mind go wild with that, you might notice that was also a custom in Bible times, which is why the Scripture says no less than six times something to the effect of greeting one another with a holy kiss. It's simply no evidence of impropriety at all. Was he a saved man? Well, let's see. He was taught by evangelical preachers his whole childhood. One historian says he was deeply read in Scripture. He could quote it with great facility, even with philological exactness. He wrote to a friend saying, Pray in God that as you are regenerated and born in Him anew, so you may arise in Him and be sanctified forever. In his writings, he constantly calls salvation a free gift, talks about salvation by faith and regeneration, and refers to one day receiving white garments washed in the blood of the Lamb. He fought with the Presbyterian preachers over the doctrine of civil government, but praised them over all the other things they preached as they praised him. He was trained by evangelical Christians, claimed to be an evangelical Christian, wrote about evangelical doctrine, and was accepted as a saved man by the preachers of his time. Had no reason to question his salvation. I know preachers today that don't have as good a testimony about all this that he did. His role in sponsoring the King James translation, he did not participate in the translation or do nearly as many things as folks have suggested he did. But when they approached him, he did authorize it, and this was extremely important. He was the first monarch in the history of our planet to sponsor and encourage the translation and distribution of the Word of God in the daily language of his people. Just a few decades earlier, William Tyndall had been burned at the stake for translating the Bible in English. His last words were, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Now a born-again English king was sponsoring an English Bible, and I want you to watch this. There were English Bibles before that, but they never received the full force of government behind them, and local bishops and sheriffs and abbots persecuted people for having them. Even though the official name of this Bible was the authorized version, the people gave it the name King James Bible. And you know why they gave it the name King James Bible? What sheriff was brave enough to come and beat you for having a Bible that came from the king? What 
religious leader dared get up and say, don't you use that Bible that came from our king. King James made the reading of the English Bible open, common, legal, and public. And when he did it, he transformed the nation. And by the way, transformed the colonies that that nation would plant. His literary accomplishments were incredible. He wrote a book about tobacco as it began to be brought over from the English colonies. He famously said a smoker and a non-smoker cannot be equally free in the same room. He wrote a book about demonology and attributed the powers of the witches in England to demons. And they vowed vengeance on him. He was a considerable scholar. We talked already about his political influences. One of the men who wrote a book about him taught, called, entitled it England's King Solomon. Just describing what he accomplished politically. I think there's a particular event recorded in his life that gives some indication of what his character was like. He had a personal servant named John Gibb. And one day King James went to a meeting and he had the officials sitting all around. And he asked Gibb for the papers he had given to him earlier in the day. And Gibb replied that the king had not given him any such papers. The king was just sure he had. I don't know if any of you preachers have ever been through this. My wife does this all the time. She absolutely forgets the things I know I gave her. <laughs> and then she sneaks into my office and puts them back on my desk. It's just shameful. But... His servant said, you never gave me those papers. And King James got angry. He, not only, he got so angry that he kicked him and ordered him out of the room. Later in the day when King James returned to his quarters, he realized the papers were right there where he left them. He was mortified. He called the entire group that had witnessed his angry outburst together, seated them all around the conference table again, brought Gibb in, knelt before him on his knees, and asked for his servant's forgiveness. You have a hard time picturing the average king of a European monarchy doing anything of that nature, but he was concerned with what was right. His influence in his own day was incredible. And folks in his own time understood whether they agreed with his teaching about the divine right of kings or not. I personally would not have. I understand why people preached against it and criticized it. But even great men make mistakes. The people of his day honored him for his wisdom in many areas political. They honored him for his morality and his godly example. He had to be gone 25 years before anybody could invent such a wild accusation and such a crazy rumor and begin to spread it against him. Even then, the rumor didn't pick up and carry for the simple reason there were too many people living who knew what his life was like and they could not imagine that he was a man of bad moral character, much less a man of perverted moral character. I'll tell you what. Christians that repeat these rumors without any investigation have done a brother in Christ great injustice. When I was a younger man and I would hear this, I would say, well, you know, God can use anybody He chooses in the matter of preserving and transmitting His Word. And of course, He's a sovereign God. He can use anybody. But, but I am, I've become convinced, studying the Scripture and watching Bible projects, that God uses people that are dedicated to Him. Not perfect people. Aren't you glad God uses imperfect people? The King James translators and King James were imperfect. If they hadn't been imperfect, they'd have got out of the Church of England and become Baptist and united with the Baptist churches of their day. I'm absolutely convinced. They understood Bible translation better than they understood church history. But God uses imperfect servants. But He uses His servants. I do not believe God would have used a person of despicable moral character to accomplish what King James accomplished. And there is absolutely no reason to question His moral character. And so I've added to the list of subjects I ask questions about 
when folks say something like, you know, King James was homosexual. No, how do you know? Everybody knows. How do they know? How does everybody know? Name one person who ever saw him commit an act of homosexuality. Give one quote that he ever said that brings his moral character into question. Give one accusation from his lifetime of anybody who ever questioned his sexual orientation. Provide an ounce of evidence. May I suggest to you this is the issue we're dealing with today? The received text was the text of the evangelical gospel preaching churches century after century after century. Tragically, in England, through the influence of Westcott and Hort in the late 1800s, and in the United States 50 years later, through the influence of men who were probably legitimate evangelicals, many of our churches, and most significantly many of our colleges, made the mistake of picking up a couple of dozen false statements about the Bible, repeating them as fact, almost unchallenged for decades. And by the time they got challenged, they already had a lot invested in these statements. And it's not an easy thing to say, I was wrong. And it's a horrendously difficult thing for Bible college leadership and faculty to get up and say, we were wrong. But information became more and more commonly available. People rose up that addressed these things. Books were written, and the Internet, for all the evil that goes over it, has provided an incredible set of resources of good information as well. And, and good, strong, sound, factual information has been available from a number of quarters, and Dr. Waite has certainly been a leader in that. And all of a sudden, people were not uninformed. And all of a sudden, people had some resources. And people had some information. And they began to address things. And folks whose position was in error had two choices. You have to admit you made an error, which requires, requires a humbleness of heart and spirit. It's often difficult for us to have. Or you have to get really desperate in defending yourself. And unfortunately, I think a lot of folks have gotten really desperate in defending themselves. Foolish things have been said. I don't know who originated this statement. I have a friend that says it all the time. I don't think it started with him. Facts are stubborn things. They're hard to dispose of. They're hard to get rid of. The truth is, King James was a pretty good example of practicing the truths that he found in the Word of God, particularly in his moral life. And anybody who gives even the slightest credibility to an accurate record would stay away from drawing accusations against his moral character and especially stay away from making accusations about the Bible translation he sponsored because of false accusations about his moral character. Boy, this is a glorious thing. Twenty-five years ago, I was challenged to study this. I'd taken the wrong position. I had it wrong for ten years. I thank God there's not much record of what I said during those years. One friend says he has tapes of me teaching the book of James from the New American Standard Bible, and someday he's going to release them. I've offered him a large amount of money not to do that. I take no responsibility for anything I said in my first ten years of ministry. But for 25 years, I've tried to be a diligent student of this. And everything I have ever found, every fact I've ever come across, every bit of historical, verifiable information I've ever found just increases my faith in the King James Bible. Thank you, dear folks.